Um, I want to take up today's theme of discourses of dissent and the relationship between social theory and political resistance by offering some thoughts about the discourses of dissent that have been deployed in certain parts of the critical academy in the wake of the cultural turn. Um, what I'm going to say is partly a critical comment on business as usual in a particular corner of the intellectual world that some of us inhabit, and it's partly a proposition for the future of critical social theory and research in troubled times. Can you hear me? Is this loud enough? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I've come to think um, that as academics, we each create our own idiosyncratic imagined communities of interlocutors, comprising those whose writings we read and engage with, those whose papers we choose to listen to at conferences and seminars, those whom we hope might read and listen to our work, colleagues we know and love, and people we've never met, often many thousands of miles away, but with whom we feel some kind of intellectual affinity. This talk, then, is a dialogue with my own personal imagined intellectual community. I'm not sure how many of you will feel yourself situated in it. Um, and it's rooted very much in my own disciplinary, transdisciplinary and theoretical affiliations. The argument is informed by the intent that's always underlain my research, which I think is a profoundly sociological concern to develop better understandings of social change in the contemporary world, entwined with a feminist, critical, queer desire to somehow mobilise theory and research for practical, transformatory political struggle. Without ever having been a Marxist with a capital M, this concern has at its heart, running through it like a stick of rock, those famous words, the point is to change it. We have to understand how the social world, social life, social relations are changing, if we're to have any possibility of changing them. Not of course, um, having cut my graduate teeth as the cultural term was in full swing in the late 80s and early 90s, that I've ever believed there is some straightforward relationship between social and political analysis and social change. So, a postmodern wariness about this taken as read, I want to argue today for an approach to social theory and research which operates in a register of criticality rather than in a register of paranoia, which is, I want to suggest, a dominant register, at least in part of my own imagined intellectual community. Underlying my argument is one of the most important lessons that I would attribute to the cultural turn, the radical shift in thinking that's brought into being by an acknowledgement of the performativity of social representations, the move which points to the ways in which our understandings of the world are constitutive of it, bring it into being. At the simplest level, what this means to me is that knowledge matters, and our models and theories and analyses grant performative force to the systems and social relations we describe. In advocating a register of criticality for social theory and research, I'm going to draw on two bodies of theory, one old and one more recent, one social, if you like, the other cultural. The first of these is the legacy of critical theory and the notion of social research that drew on this that was developed by the Frankfurt Institute from the late 20s onwards. As director of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research, Horkheimer described the aims of the Institute as being to pursue the great philosophical questions using the most finely honed scientific methods, to reformulate the questions during the work on the subject, to state things precisely, to think of new methods, and yet never lose sight of the general. Central to the work of the Institute was Horkheimer's distinction between traditional and critical theory. Critical theory seeks human emancipation, aiming to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. According to the Frankfurt School, this normative agenda is to be pursued through interdisciplinary empirical social research, which combines attention to psychological, economic, cultural and social forms of life, which is always historical, philosophically engaged, theory building, with a strong political commitment. I wonder, this is an aside, how many of you somewhat shudder with embarrassment at the words emancipation and liberate? Um, they're quite hard words to speak in this post-modern post world. Um, I think our postmodern scepticism runs very deep now. So although Horkheimer's early optimism about the possibilities of social theory and research was replaced by an understandable pessimism as um, fascism swept across Europe, Strains of optimism remained in the Frankfurt School in Marcuse's engagement with the events of 1968 and in Habermas's normative project later in the century. The legacy of critical theory is, I think, a mixed bag. 
in terms of substantive research topics, its preoccupations don't tally very, very closely with my own um, research preoccupations, or indeed of much of my intellectual community. But nonetheless, the spirit and mantle of critical theory has been taken up in recent years by scholars working within feminist, critical race and post-colonial frameworks. I'm thinking of writers like Sheila Ben-Habib, Drusilla Cornell, Nancy Fraser, Jessica Benjamin and others. According to Craig Cahoon, this expanded tradition of critical theory performs a critical engagement with the theorist's contemporary social world, recognising that the exist existing state of affairs does not exhaust all possibilities and offering positive implications for social action. In Habermas's terms, and echoing Marx, it's a theory of society conceived with practical intention. So what I take from this, and what I think is still relevant today, is some kind, and I reiterate, some kind of attachment or movement towards an emancipatory, transformatory role for social theory and research in the tradition of critical theory. From cultural theory, from recent cultural theory, then, I want to draw on the notion of criticality as developed by Irit Rogoff. Rogoff's distinction between criticism, critique, <coughs> and criticality, I think, is a generative one. She discusses how, in the field of visual culture studies, there's been a move from criticism to critique, and then to criticality. She explains this move thus. From finding fault to examining the underlying assumptions that might allow something to appear as a convincing logic, to, operate, to operating from an uncertain <coughs> ground, which, while building on critique, wants nevertheless to inhabit culture in a relationship other than one of critical analysis, other than one of illuminating flaws, locating elisions, allocating blames. If criticism is about the application of values and judgments operating from a barely acknowledged humanist index of measure, sustained by naturalised beliefs and disavowed interests, critique is the post-structuralist move that negates criticism subjecting naturalised beliefs, interests and truth claims to deconstruction. The problem with this, Rogoff argues, is that the emphasis on allocating blames and pointing out elisions and injustices is a vicious circle from which there is no way out. She advocates instead a criticality which focuses on the present, on living out a situation, understanding culture as a series of effects rather than causes, actualising some of its potential rather than revealing its faults. In criticality, she says, we have that double occupation in which we are both fully armed with the knowledge of critique, able to analyse and unveil, while at the same time sharing and living out the very conditions which we are able to see through. As such, we live out a duality that requires at the same time both an analytical mode and a demand to produce new subjectivities that acknowledge that we are what Hannah Arendt has termed fellow sufferers of the very conditions we're critically examining. So I want to suggest that while there can be no return to criticism in the post-structuralist or post-post-structuralist era, the spirit of critical theories, future-oriented, practical social theory and research might be harnessed in conjunction with criticality's emphasis on the potentiality of the present in all the complexities of our implication in its creation and recreation to offer a productive way of approaching social theory and research. Rogoff's desire to move beyond the allocation of blame and the finding of fault resonates strongly with the argument made recently by Eve Sedgwick in her brilliantly titled essay, Paranoid Reading and Reparative Reading, or You're So Paranoid You Probably Think This Essay Is About You. <laughs> One of the best things for me about the cultural turn has been that I've felt free, or indeed perhaps even obliged, to read the work of literary scholars, philosophers and cultural theorists in a way that was never encouraged in my training as a sociologist. And Eve Sedgwick stands out amongst these cultural theorists as a powerful wellspring of ideas that have inspired my work. Now, this article in her book, Touching Feeling, really struck a chord because it articulated in a beautifully succinct and precise way a dissatisfaction that I've long had with much research and writing within my imagined intellectual community. Sedgwick's target is primarily working queer theory, but it applies to much of the contemporary critical academy. Her argument is based on an interest in the question, what does knowledge do? A concern with the performativity of knowledge. Drawing on Paul Ricoeur's concept of the hermeneutics of suspicion, which he used to describe the work and legacies of Marx, Nietzsche and Freud, and therefore might be attributed to the um, critical theory tradition, 
which he posited alongside a hermeneutics of recovery of meaning. She points to how the hermeneutics of suspicion has become a mandatory injunction in the contemporary critical academy. This privileging of suspicion is fundamentally linked to an attitude of paranoia, she says, and paranoia is now less a diagnosis than a prescription. Now, while she says she doesn't want to return to paranoia as a pathologizing diagnosis, as it was for Freud, she does regret the situation we are now in, where, quote, to theorize out of anything but a paranoid critical stance has come to seem naive, pious, or complacent. And she quotes Litvak as saying, paranoia has enormous prestige as the very signature of smartness. Now, her argument goes on to explore the ways in which paranoia has a particular place as an object of study in anti-homophobic theory. Um, looking at the historical association made by Freud between paranoia and the repression of same-sex desire. And uh, she sees a con continuity between this and the centrality of what she calls paranoid reading practice.